We need something for our young people to do is a common refrain in adult circles today. Daily news reports about roving teenagers getting into mischief during the wee hours of the morning don't make any sense to me. Every time I see that a group of young people has caused some fracas at 2 a.m., I wonder, who has time and energy to be out cavorting at 2 a.m.? Our children went to bed at 9 or 10 p.m. and we're grateful for the opportunity. Our apprentices and interns normally dismiss themselves from our company and head off to bed as soon after dark as they can get there. That young people today, at least when they are not in school, spend the day lounging around, hanging out, and then go into the wee hours burning off excess energy is aberrant in the first degree. Add to that the pastime of playing video games, exercising only thumb muscles and fingertips, and folks, we have a situation that just ain't normal. When the biggest thrill of life is becoming competent enough on the video game to achieve level 5 performance, what kind of environment are we creating for our future leaders? When I sit in airports and watch these testosterone-exuding boys with their shriveled shoulders and E.T.-looking fingers passing the time on their laptops, I realize that this is normal for them. This isn't happening because they are sitting in an airport trying to while away the time. This is actually how many, if not most, of their hours are spent. Recreation, entertainment, and playing around. Contrast that with historical normalcy. Here is a list of chores for young people since time immemorial. Number one, chopping, cutting, and gathering firewood. In the days before petroleum and electricity, every able-bodied person contributed to keeping the household warm during the winter months. This wood accumulation required a knowledge of the forest and of what kind of wood burns well. Not all wood is created equal. Resinous woods, like evergreens, coat the inside of the chimney and unless mixed half and half with non-resinous, will accumulate too much soot on the inside of the chimney or flue. This highly combustible residue can become a fire hazard. Whenever we cut down a pine tree, therefore, we want to look around for at least equal parts hardwoods to balance out the fuel for the fireplace or wood stove. Green wood cut from standing, living trees contains 30% or more water, and this moisture retards the fire because before the wood can burn, it must evaporate the water. A skilled wood gatherer knows to seek dead and dry wood for immediate burning, but to stockpile the green wood for future burning. But all dead and downed wood is not equally dry. If the dead wood is up off the ground a little, it will be perfect. A standing snag is ideal most of the time. Sometimes it has already rotted and turned to powder, common in soft deciduous trees like poplar or red maple. If the dead or downed wood is on the ground, it may be too rotten to burn. Burning wood is essentially an extremely fast rotting process. What soil microbes do over an extended period, a fire does in a short period. If the combustible carbon is already decomposed through the rotting process, nothing is left to burn. All wood gives off about the same BTUs per pound, but different woods weigh different amounts per cubic foot. Heavy woods like white oak and hickory give off twice as much heat per cubic foot than light woods like poplar or white pine. Gathering wood, then, requires a fair amount of knowledge to be done well. Beyond the knowledge is the skill to gather it efficiently. Obviously, if we're going to the forest to bring in firewood, we will take our tools, like a chainsaw, that would be modern, crosscut or bucksaw, that's pre-modern, or an axe, that's old. Or imagine the Native Americans who either used stone axes or built fires around big trees to fell them. That required yet another whole skill set one that I don't possess. But I do know how to run a chainsaw, a wonderful modern invention. I also know how to swing an axe, sharpen an axe, and replace the handle on an axe, all skills I developed as a youth. Once the wood is cut, it must be loaded into a vessel, trailer, pickup truck bed, hay wagon, whatever. It never ceases to amaze me when I go to the woods with our apprentices and interns how much I have to teach about efficiently gathering wood. First, we stack the branches with all the butts facing one way and uphill because the fluffy branch ends tend to build vertical height faster than the butts. If you stack the branches haphazardly, the pile gets too high too fast. By carefully placing the branches, we can get far more on the pile. When we begin picking up the cut pieces of wood, we want to get the vessel as close to the wood as possible. No walking. Pitch it into the vessel. If the piece is too big to throw, of course, then you may have to walk, but we want to keep backing the vessel.